Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Test Tubes and Cauldrons, a podcast where we talk about the science behind spirituality. So today we are going to do our second part of this like double, double toil and trouble episode. And we're going to kind of talk more about the magical side of herbs and how we work with them, discussing kind of maybe where they get their like magical properties like from. Um, Is it all based on the chemical characteristics and nature of those? Or do we take on a more animistic worldview among a bunch of other topics? So like stay and join us if that interests you. But before we get started on that, let's go ahead and do our what happened on this day. Giovanni Battista Riccioli, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, was an Italian astronomer who was the first to observe a double star in 1650. And a double star are two stars so close together that they appear to be one. Mizar in the Earth's the major, and then the middle star in the handle of the Big Dipper. He also discovered the satellite shadows on Jupiter, and in 1651, he assigned most of the lunar feature names that we currently use within astronomy, which is super interesting. He named a lot of the more prominent features after famous astronomers, scientists, and philosophers, while the darker and smoother areas he didn't actually like name specifically. But yeah, super interesting. Another fun fact, today was the day that Apollo 13 returned to Earth safely after its adventures out in space and Belle I think you have another exciting thing <laughs> that happened today I do oh and for anyone who doesn't know about Apollo 13 Apollo 13 is the where the famous erroneous line uh, Houston we have a problem comes from mm. so hooray they made it back safe and I guess what happened on this day is Felicity got vaccinated half <laughs> half of Pfizer so if I stop making sense partway through this episode it's because the post-vaccine exhaustion has kicked in oh gosh <laughs> Yeah, I think I got vaccinated in April 1st, actually, I think was the day I got vaccinated, which is nice. But yeah, let's just get started. So last week, we talked about herbalism, but we really got like very scientific about it and like very in depth into the herbs and the properties that they have and how they work in the body. And so we're going to kind of take more of a magical perspective this week and talk about herbalism and witchcraft. So commonly, we see this with like charm bags, spell jars. Eh, we all know how. <laughs> How do you feel about spell jars and spell work in general? So the first thing I, re- I kind of want to touch on is this discussion of like the use of herbs in a person's spellcraft. And something that I hear a lot is this idea that if you want to use an herb in a jar, in a charm bag, whatever, that you have to charge it with a particular intent. So my question to both of you, kind of just to start off, is are the natural characteristics of the herbs enough? Or do you think we actually have to charge them with a particular intent in order to like help them do their thing. And if that's the case, why are we even using them at all? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I have never ever charged my herbs. It's actually quite a new uh, concept to me. <laughs> I kind of feel like the the spirit of a plant and its chemical properties are sufficient. But when you are working out which aspect of a plant to work with, because they do have lots of different correspondences, the way you can modulate that is actually through your method of preparation, or maybe the, t- the part of the plant you use, or maybe your harvesting method. So there are ways that you can change the way you interact with the herb that to me, it's not really so much about intent and like telling the plant what to do. It's more about the selection of the like appropriate part of the botan- botanical. What, what do you base the selection on then? Like if it's not about, okay, I'm going to ask you to walk me through your process or something. So like if you were going to select an herb for a particular working, like how would you go about doing that? So a lot of this comes from this idea of like the physical visual properties actually affect the correspondences. So mm-hmm. you might say that the root of something is, you know, maybe the root is more rich in a particular chemical compound, which is calming, or maybe the spines of something are quite like thorny and protective. So for example, for gorse, which is one example, I might collect multiple parts of that plant and I would say, okay, the spines of the gorse, they're very spiky, they're protective, I can use that in a protective charm. Whereas the flowers of the gorse, they are bright, they're yellow, they correspond more to the kind of hopefulness, the optimism. So it's kind of more about the the way those particular elements of the plant are chemically and physically that helps me choose which parts to use. Yeah, I guess for me, I always found it confusing as like a young practitioner, like what charging meant. And even still, sometimes I'm like, but what do people mean when they say like, 
charge <laughs> um, because it's, it's often very vague. When I say charging, I mostly just visualize or verbalize the intent of the herb that I'm using. Just kind of like state to myself and also, I don't know, the universe or whatever, like what I'm using this herb for. So for example, every um, Numenia my housemate and I, which is like a Hellenic thing. I'm not going to go into it here. It's basically the new moon, essentially. Like when you first see the the sliver of the new moon. My housemate and I make what is called a cadiscus, which is to one of the epithets of Zeus. And it's kind of it's kind of weirdly like a spell jar when you think about it. But basically what it is, it's, it's a big container of some kind. And you put things from your pantry in there. So like olive oil would be traditional, wine, vinegar, honey. And then you put it on your pantry to kind of have Zeus, the Zeus Cathasios of the pantry to watch over your pantry, essentially. Interestingly enough, like since I consider myself a revivalist, I often blend my other basis and like modern and folk practices into my current practice. So my housemate and I will take clove, for example, which we have a lot of, and say protection and then put it in there or like clove for protection or rosemary or something like that and we'll just kind of state the purpose of the herb while we're putting it in there but for certain things like bay leaves which are just kind of a traditional offering in hellenism like we won't say what we're putting that in there for we just kind of put it in or like i'm not putting the olive oil in there for any specific reason <laughs> other than that it's from my pantry and a traditional item to put in there so yeah i guess generally if i'm doing like more folk magic -y type things I will state out loud or in my head what I kind of want the herb to do partly like just to guide myself through the the spell but when it's like other things I won't <laughs> but most things I, I tend not to like charge it because I'm not really using them in that folk magic -y way I'm using them more because it's what they would have been used for or just kind of in that tradition they're only used for this thing I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> that does I have a yeah. curiosity question to ask before I give like my thoughts why why is it Zeus who looks over the pantry isn't he like I don't <laughs> even know is he, is he associated with like food that I'm not aware of I mean it's like it's what's the that person it's the epithet, basically. So okay. Zeus, because he's like, you know, big, like, you know, the big sky god, which a lot of cultures have, he's has like a bajillion epithets. <laughs> like Zeus is also known as Zeus the Agathos Daemon, Zeus the Good Spirit, where he's symbolized by like a kind snake. So there's just like a lot of epithets from probably more localized or indigenous gods that just kind of got shoved onto Zeus. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the, the answer. For okay, you there. Right. Yeah, I've never heard that before. So that was yeah. interesting. Okay. So for me, I think the idea of charging seems a little ridiculous in like the traditional sense that I hear it talked about. Like I people will like hold like I've heard people say they like hold an herb in their hand and they charge it. And at first like charging to me, that word indicates that you're like pushing energy into something. Like we would charge like a talisman or an amulet with like your own energy or energy that you've drawn up or drawn down from somewhere. But I don't necessarily think that like the herbs need to be charged themselves because they already have their own properties. And so for me, it's less so about charging and it's more about directing the herb to utilize the energies that correspond like with my intent and I, I really only do this for herbs that have mult like a multitude of correspondences so kind of the first example that comes to mind is basil and magically it can be used for love exorcism wealth and protection which are all very different energies very different kind of purposes something and I'm gonna kind of backtrack a little bit <laughs> Something that I've talked about in other spaces before, mostly in the Discord servers that we're in, is that I think of spell work a lot like a funnel. So it's absolutely possible to do spell work without any tools and your energy alone. That's how I started. I think it would actually do a lot of practitioners good to maybe start there. If you're just doing something with your own energy, then when you send out that energy, it's it's very wide. So like you have a target but you can't accurately aim for it because kind of the energy that you're sending out is just, it's wide. It could more easily kind of dissipate and get distracted. It's not super concentrated. So the more correspondences you add, kind of the further down the funnel you go and the more narrow your aim becomes until you're at the very bottom and you're able to like line it up directly with your intent. So charging, and I'm, I'm saying that in air quotes, is less important as directing the energy. So saying like for basil, for instance, if I wanted to do use it for protection, then I would just simply, as I'm adding the basil to whatever it is I'm working with, I would just be like, 
Basil, like your your job, like the point of you being in the spell is to protect me. So like lend me your protecting energy and so on and so forth. So yeah, I think the idea of charging an herb is kind of silly because <laughs> the herb is like, it's, it's alive. I mean, it still like has that kind of living energetic properties, but it just needs to be directed more so than charged specifically. So I also want to talk about the, the correspondences. Do we think they come from, like, I guess, do they have any, like, scientific basis? I addressed this with Nike when she had me on her channel, which was very kind of her. But I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this idea. Like, is that the main basis for their correspondence? Is, like, their chemical properties? Or is there more to it, do you think? I think that a lot of correspondence is come from two things one how it's used scientifically and by scientifically i more mean like folk medicines because like there wasn't necessarily like what we would consider science tm so like what i would consider folk remedies and then folklore i think is generally where correspondences come from and the folklore is less tied to what like the effect that the plant has and more like explaining the life cycle of the plant or explaining how the plant interacts in nature or also like for example the white heather is supposed to grow where no blood has fallen for example or it's tied to the history of the land that's where i think correspondences tend to come from which is why when i look at correspondences the first thing i look at is how it is used in herbalism i think that says a lot about a plant and then i'll look at the folklore and poetry, which is another reason I love Picture This, is because Picture This has little poems that were written about that plant at some point, which I think is very informative. And then I will look at more pop <laughs> magic circles to see what other people have gleaned, like any shared personal gnosis between people. So that's what I tend to do when I look at correspondences of something. So I think it's like super layered, actually. Like I think we can't really deny that there are biochemical influences on the way that we perceive a plant. And this is either because they have like active ingredients in them. So that might be like hallucinogens in um, things like ayahuasca. But um, there are also things like taste and smell, which are very powerful and they influence the way we perceive plants. That said, I don't really think it's the only thing. I think the actual physical appearance of a plant has a lot to, to say. So even just the shape, something that's more pointy might be associated more with like defensive magic, whereas something that is kind of softer and has kind of lighter colored flowers might be associated with purity. So I agree that there's a lot here to say about like folklore and looking into how it was used historically and how we can kind of marry that with our modern conception. And that's kind of where the, the more animist stuff comes in for me. I did come up across some really interesting stuff that I wanted to ask Astra about, about alchemy and how we can like alter the properties of a plant through alchemy and then kind of utilize those planetary correspondences. So I don't know how valid this is, but I was seeing how you could calcinize lavender and that because that calcinization yields trigonal crystals, those trigonal crystals correspond to mercury. So you use it for a mercury working. And that's actually not the correspondence I've ever seen for lavender before. So I was just kind of curious how fluid and dynamic this is and like whether you think we can kind of play with them in this way. Yeah, definitely. So alchemy is really interesting because one of the primary things in spagyrics is like separating both the mercury, the sulfur, and then the salt of a particular plant. And the calcination comes from us getting the salt of the plant. So essentially you burn it <laughs> until it forms this like white ashy powder. And then you dissolve that into water, you let the water boil down, and you you will eventually form crystals. Yeah, I would say that there are certain properties that that you can correspond maybe to other like planets. Like lavender, personally, I've always as associated it with Venus because I think lavender, like stress relief, love, kind of all of those th like relationships, all of those things correspond very heavily to Venus for me. But at the same time, I also know lavender plays a key role in like our neurological systems, acting as kind of like a substitute neurotransmitter. If you think about it in that way, then you could also certainly associate it with mercury without even looking at the the physical um, shape of the crystals. I can't really speak to that because I've never, I haven't done any calcinations yet myself. Um, I'm still trying to figure out like a safe way <laughs> to perform alchemy in my home so I don't burn anything down or... Um, you know, do anything crazy. Lavender, in a sense, because it helps kind of remove the blockages of like the stress from your day or your job or whatever, you could say that it, it allows you to be your more authentic self. And like that idea in and of itself is very reminiscent of Mercury. Desire to continuously grow and removing the things that will inhibit you from growing and the things that are super important to you and will help you be like a more holistic and well-informed individual. 
So yeah, I do think that like every plant has an assigned planetary correspondence, but I don't necessarily think that's the only one. And it's one of those things where you kind of get into this realm of personal gnosis as well. So it's valid to an extent. And I think if you can, you can back it up with like, since I don't, I haven't really gotten into like Gematria or kind of like the geometric kind of models and, and their correspondences there. But if like this trigonal pattern that is seen with the crystals of the lavender is associated with Mercury, then that's certainly like a physical characteristic you could use and you're working and you like can maybe use that to combine both the forces of mercury and venus in a working there's lots of creativity like ways you can use for that definitely alchemy is really interesting because you do get that separation of all of the kind of three different components and typically like the idea is that you separate and then you purify and then you recombine to get something that's even stronger and you know i had a higher purity like spiritual purity than it was before so yeah totally like i think that's a legitimate claim to make Okay, so I don't really subscribe to the animistic model. I I think it's it's valid, certainly, in um, many ways. And I know it's really popular for a lot of people that, like, I'm really good friends with. But when I use herbs, I really base them much more off of their planetary correspondence than I do their actual properties. That's much more important to me than, than anything else, really. I also think that the chemical properties or the biochemical properties and the magical properties are often very, like, synchronous. So I have a couple examples of that that I know just like, from my own research. But so high sop, for instance, is a great ingredient ingredients to include in a tea if you're suffering from like a cold or you have some kind of like congestion from um, it's like springtime right so we're all a little bit congested but that also ties in really well with its magical property of like purification right so getting rid of all the gunk and like purifying in a similar way wormwood is another example because one of its uses is to promote sweating and interestingly enough um, I've seen this translated to being good for like love or sex magic getting the blood flowing you could say to, to you know up the excitement there really in my experience pretty much every herb that I have come across granted this is limited because I'm not an herbalist I really don't use them that much it seems to have a tie between its mundane properties and its magical correspondence I haven't really found any that don't if there are some like let me know <laughs> that'd be great to, to get some more examples of that but yeah so typically it's they go in hand for me, for sure. It's interesting because over the years, I've like, I've realized that I've like slowly started like, or not started. I kind of like realized that I always was in some ways subscribing to some kind of animistic model. So I'm a gardener uh, and an inspire, aspiring urban homesteader. <laughs> so I have like a, like I just got a bay laurel plant today and I am delighted i i do a lot of gardening and i work very intensely with the land it also stems from you know my environmentalism it's like very important to me like the, the earth and all of the plants so i tend to see value in life and everything from like weeds to you know the big oaks that live in the local park in some ways i guess for me i tend to when i work with herbs i actually it's funny because like i don't even though i, I talk about how much i garden and um, I like take pictures and post pictures all the time of my plants. I actually don't really work with them that much <laughs> just because I tend to work with local plants first or ones that I grow myself before I go to ones that are like well known like cinnamon, for example. So like mullen is a plant, a local quote unquote weed that grows here. And, you know, most people you say mullen, they're not even gonna know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> I, I find that a lot of it for me is getting to know the plant. So if I, I, I grabbed Mullen for the first time a few weeks back and I, I literally just walked with it home and just rubbed it between my fingers because it's very soft. And I Googled its, you know, herbal herbal prop properties that it has. And mullein tea is good for breathing and just sort of sitting with the plant. So I guess in some ways, uh, my model kind of very much is, is tied to this animistic way. And a lot of that, too, is how I view nature spirits and and nymphs or, you know, genus loci. Um Working with them that way, working with them ground up, which is another reason why I don't really charge things, because if I'm working from it, like from harvesting it myself or growing it myself, then it's kind of like, well, I'm charging it with those intents from the beginning. So that's just kind of my my own view, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. It's it's a definitely a very interesting perspective. Like I I don't see it like that, so I love hearing kind of about how other people like think of it. Right? Or like I like I often think 
that witches or practitioners, whatever, don't work with flowers as much as they should. Like flowers have so many great properties. (laughs) I rarely ever see flowers mentioned or trees or like branches. So that's, I guess for me, like I prioritize the plant itself and, and why, you know, I'll reach first to the dandelion before I reach for I was gonna say calendula but I actually have calendula that I grow so that's not a good example but like I I reach for you know the dandelion before I reach for the clove because I don't grow cloves dandelions are abundant and have like a bajillion properties (laughs) because every part of the dandelion is usable I definitely think flowers are flowers are definitely something to me like candy you mentioned correspondence is based on like physical appearance I probably incorporate that more when it comes to like flowers or anything that does bloom and like look really pretty um for sure I, I the physical aspect plays a role in kind of the correspondence that I associate it with Um, that's definitely true for flowers like a thousand percent I also think flowers are terribly underrated in the witchcraft community even just like listen picking flowers that like correspond to your intention and like putting them in a vase in your home can do wonders just for your mood alone I mean you don't have to like go crazy and make a syrup if you don't want to just picking a couple and putting them in a vase will, will you know help There's something to be said about how transient they are as well, because obviously with herbs, you can kind of dry them and keep them, whereas the flowers, you kind of have to use them quickly. When you watch a plant grow, you're kind of watching it grow and bloom in that very short time period. There's something really special about seeing it and just understanding um, how it interacts with its environment, how it interacts with pollinators. I think that's kind of where the animism comes in for me watching these ecosystems interact. I don't necessarily think of animism in the same way as I've seen in lots of books where people are like, they really anthropomorphize plants. So they say, you know, they gender a particular plant or they say, I mean, I even saw it in one book. I said, this is this is the kind of botanical that I could sit down and have a glass of wine with. I was like, mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't personally like vibe with that because I think that plants are fundamentally different to us like in spirit but that doesn't mean that they don't have something that you can interact with I just don't think it's in quite the same way as this like heavily anthropomorphic model so for you Henny is it more like this idea that everything is so connected and thus everything has an energy that's like equally as important is that kind of what what you're getting at when you talk about your animistic worldview or am I missing something there no that's that's valid I think yeah it's about kind of everything being like infused with the spark of life and um, being kind of unique because of that. Um, And so everything has its own role to play in the ecosystem. So it has its spirit and its correspondences are kind of linked to its role there, which again kind of Mm. of comes back to what we're saying about like the physical properties being linked to the correspondences because, you know, when a flower is very bright and it smells very attractive, those Venusian energies are like attracting pollinators, you know, they're attracting us. There's, There's a lot of kind of intermingling there, I think, of these correspondences. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. The next question we had, this is interesting, and I'm, I am curious to kind of hear your thoughts on this, because I've heard so many different takes on how this works. What do you think happens when you, like, take a bunch of herbs and you put them into a jar or you put them into a bag or you maybe put them into a bowl of salt and use them in a particular working? How are they working together? Are they working together? Or is each herb, like, should it be considered separately or as a collective whole or maybe something different entirely? I kind of think of spell work like baking. I'm using a lot of analogies in this episode. But I think of spell work a lot like baking. So each each component that you add has its own unique properties. But, like, when you bring them together as a collective whole, there's kind of, like, an overall feel of your of your spell. And it typically correlates with your intention. And each, each herb is bringing something to the table specifically, but when everything is combined together, it, it provides a very unique product that's very specific to that, that spell. And so I don't think that they are separate at that particular point. I think it's turned into something actually different, which is one of the reasons why I always like suggest that people make their own spells because you can really tailor that to be what you want it to be as like your end result. I see this a lot and it really irritates me, but throwing shit into a jar and just like stealing it with wax um, isn't going to do anything. I think a lot of people forget that herbs are tools. Like, and this is, this is my perspective and some people might think differently, but herbs to me are a tool. They're not something that like, 
That's not entirely true. I was going to say the herbs don't have their like own inherent magic, but I think they do. But I don't think that like throwing herbs into a jar, even if they do have their own like inherent magical properties is going to do anything because you, the practitioner, are the one who provides the energy or the direction of the spell to like go. I hope that made sense. (laughs) Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, to me, I think I've brought this up before. If not, I'll bring it up now. I, I like when I was a young practitioner on yield tumbler days, I would see people using uh, like for this love, self love spell, put in Lang Lang and patchouli and, you know, like all these things that are not native to everyone's areas and expensive. Or just, you know, in order to get Lang Lang, I, well, I could probably go to Whole Foods and get that. But at the time, I would mostly, like, go to, like, where there was no Whole Foods, I would have to go to one of the weird New Age stores where it's $25. The smallest five, thing five, Yeah, 0.5 milliliters. Yeah. Oh, and I would be like, oh, well, now I can't do this spell. And now I'm just like, I pick up spiky sweet gums and put them in the perimeters. It is protective. <laughs> no one ever told me to do that. You know, sweet gums are a hardwood. They're strong. And the little seed pods are extremely spiky. And if you follow us on Instagram, which you should. I've made a post about sweet gums specifically. Just a plug really quickly. Um, Our Instagram is just test tubes and cauldrons. So same name as the podcast. Type it in, you'll find us. So I think when it comes to herbs specifically, I think sometimes people undervalue educated uh, UPG. Because I I think like when you're working with local plants, I'm going to go outside and harvest garlic mustard, which is extremely invasive in my area. Uh, I couldn't, I've never seen garlic mustard mentioned in a witchy book (laughs) ever before. So in that aspect, getting to know the land and getting to know the herbs, the only way to do it is kind of sitting with the herb, Uh, which is why I think in a lot of ways when people just like make these spells or follow spells and just throw a bunch of things in a jar without understanding the plant it's like you have a computer for example like a desktop computer and so much electricity and so much power but you don't have the plug in (laughs) it's not turned on so those plants that you're working with like they do have magical properties or spiritual properties whatever you want to call them but if you're not putting in any sort of effort they're not going to turn on in that this is just analogy the episode i guess but that's a good analogy i think so you can put things in a jar you want but if you're not i don't know doing it with any sort of consideration you're just kind of having a computer that's not turned on and nothing's happening yeah i think it's kind of like a way to to sort of narrow things down so you can say okay I don't know, imagine I'm doing some kind of calm and clarity spell. And for some reason, all I have on hand is like lavender and chili flakes. Those things are probably going to work against each other. You kind of have to think about like how they're going to work together and what correspondences they share and what which ones are against each other. So with lavender, it's going to be very calming, whereas chili flakes are kind of more kind of invigorating and spicy. So what's the end result of that going to be? Are you going to feel like clarity or are those just going to cancel one another out? I think there's something to be said for experimenting, but I don't think you can just think of the ingredients as separate and say, okay, well, I'm going to have this, this from this, this from this, this from this, this from this. Otherwise, you just put as many things in together as possible. You have to kind of think about how they interact with one another in order to build something successfully. Something that I've come across recently in my alchemical studies is this idea of ingredient or like <clears throat> herbs specifically. They fall in this is kind of this is based on the four elements, but they they all fall into into categories. Like you could have hot and wet, or like hot and dry, or cold and wet, and like cold and dry, and all of these things. And that's just the kind of the the ways that you would maybe describe particular herbs. And it's this idea that like if you include like a hot and dry with a cold and wet, those are complete opposites, and so they're not going to work cohesively together. Um, and so if you want to make a tincture of something, this is, and this is something I found in both the alchemy and anyway, it's complicated. Anyway, if you were going to treat symptoms in a particular person, let's say these symptoms were things that fit well with the idea of like hot and dry, you wouldn't treat those symptoms with a tincture made of hot and dry based herbs. That, that doesn't make any sense, right? You, well, you want something to counteract to change whatever they're experiencing, assuming it's bad in this particular case. And so the, that that kind of thought process, I think, is something that people should go through a little bit more when it comes to, like, using herbs in spells. It's 
do the properties like all seem to work together because you if you use two items that like are complete opposites and are on opposite sides of the spectrum they're not going to be cohesive and you're going to just have this mixture that is like a bundle of energy that doesn't even know what it's doing because you've got confliction within the spell itself and it's like thinking very carefully about what you include anything in that way can be really helpful um, and leads to much stronger magic because then everything kind of just builds on itself rather than being destructive. That's a really, really, really good analogy, I think. Um, one other thing I want to bring up is that I think you can get around this, and I think maybe we'll bring it up later, with the way that you prepare something. So maybe if you were to use, say, like the leaves of a chili plant, or maybe you would want to use um, non-dried chili flakes, which aren't as spicy, or I'm just kind of postulating here, but there might be ways that you can prepare a botanical where the properties you get from it are slightly different. And so those energies are not quite as opposite to one another. But I think there has to be a lot of like personal experimentation and you have to really know the plant in order for that to work for you. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious about your thoughts on this idea that like, so we, we hear this a lot and I don't necessarily agree with it, but that like rosemary can be substituted for anything. What, what, do, you, what do you all think of that? Like the universal substitute, just like when we talk about candle magic, right? White can be so, like substituted for any color, right? Same kind of idea. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't get that. I. I mean, are you just saying like, oh, it's the universal correspondence because it corresponds to so many things? So, I don't. I don't really know where that came from. To be totally honest, um, I remember hearing it for one of the first times when I like joined a Discord server, and I was like, what? Well, why would why would herbalism exist? Like, if we yeah. if, if we could just use rosemary, why would we have all these other plants that we're using? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really yeah. superb. But it's like, definitely like been around since 2012 on the ye old cursed days of Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> definitely even probably before. I said, God, when did I join? Or oh, I've been a part of Tumblr since it was just for emo kids. TM. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but no, that's been a thing since I joined Witch Blur in like 2010, 2011. It's been a thing for a while. And I was like, okay, as a young practitioner. Yeah, when I first started too, I, I was like, yeah, okay, well, that's fine. But like the more I, as I grew as a practitioner and the more that I thought about it, I was like, I don't really understand why people say this or like why people think this because rosemary is, is its own herb and it has very unique properties and I don't think it can just like substitute anything I mean trying to substitute nettle with rosemary like those are two totally like different herbs that have very different properties magically and like mundanely I don't think substitute mandrake for rosemary I see you talk <laughs> about mandrake later yeah <laughs> that'd be wild <laughs> oh, I don't understand anyways yeah I was just curious about your thoughts on that Hanny, do you want to take this next one? Because it was yours. Yeah, so I kind of was thinking about genetics um, because that is unfortunately what I work in. <laughs> and I was thinking about um, how that can kind of correspond to, to plant correspondences. So stick with me here. But basically, I was noticing that sometimes related plants often have very similar correspondences. So particularly in the rosaceae family, we have lots of plants um, like meadow sweet and many fruit crops like pears and strawberries and a lot of these have kind of similar correspondences to do with like fertility and to do with like abundance and I was kind of wondering how if we're in the animus model do we think about this as these plants are related and therefore they are they share correspondences because of their like biological relationship is it just a coincidence these these plants like often look quite different to one another which I think is really interesting and then the other thing I wanted to talk about was how much of this is just due to culture. So, for example, there are quite a lot of herbs and botanicals that are used in the US witchcraft. They have the same names as what the plants that were used in the UK, but they're actually completely different plants. So one example is American mandrake is Podophyllum patelton versus Mandaragora. Apparently, I, I can't verify for myself, apparently quite hard to get hold of Mandaragora in the US. And the latter has kind of hallucinogenic properties. So it was used previously for like flying ointments, things like that. But it's kind of interesting that they're used in the same way. So how much of this is due to just like the cultural relevance? So, okay, they say this is Mandrake, so Mandrake works this way. And how much is just, is due to the kind of relationship between the plants? Does that make sense? Like, do, yeah. are we thinking about phylogeny? Does it matter? That's hard because I also think what comes to mind first is mint, right? So you have all these different types of mint, like regular mint, spearmint, 
um, the other, you know, 20,000 kinds that I can't think of right now. And whenever I have like looked into men specifically um, and been like, well, what, like, what are the correspondences of maybe like these, the, these different like subtypes of men, even though they all kind of fall under the same general category. And I've, I really struggled to find like differentiation between them. It's always just like mint as a general category is good for all of these things. And so I think a lot of it is cultural because I don't know that like the differences between such interrelated plants is different enough to like be relevant, if that makes sense. I don't know. That's really, yeah, that's really interesting. I think it could add something maybe, but unless like the physical differences are super apparent and like maybe the chemical differences are also really apparent, I don't know that it would really make it make a difference. It would be interesting to maybe look at the, what causes like the phenotypic changes between different species within the same family. I'm, I'm not like a herbalist here so my taxonomy and like the ordering there is I don't remember which which order it goes in but yeah I'd be curious to look at the kind of the the genotypic and phenotypic relationship there so for people who aren't familiar genotype is referring to like the DNA and phenotype as like the physical characteristics right yeah that'd be an interesting thing to look into maybe I will maybe I'll like pull a couple plants and just like look at the ones that are in the same family I just I think it's really interesting with mandrake specifically because one of those is like quite hallucinogenic And the other one, not so much at all. They're both toxic, but only one of them has properties. But they're used in exactly the same way. Um, So I just thought that was kind of interesting. You know what the differences are? Like, why does one produce the hallucinogen and the other not? (laughs) Because they're just different. They're different plants. Oh, they're different different entirely. Okay. Yeah, but they just have the same common name, which is confusing. But because they have that same common name, I think there's, like, enough cultural significance that it can kind of overcome the differences between the two if that makes sense Mm. so I was just kind of wondering like how much of this is actually just based on our cultural understanding probably kind of quite a bit of it though because I think that's something else and Felicity when you were talking earlier I was thinking about this we always say that like witchcraft should be something you should use what you have access to right so if you don't have access to a particular herb that is maybe a part of your working then like find something that you do have access to that like performs a similar function and use that instead when like a lot of um which is in america i know will like go through these books and they'll see these spells and there'll be an herb that they don't have access to and so they'll go out and like buy it even though it's super expensive and it's like well you don't need to do that like you live in a different area well what you have access to is going to be different and part of like learning the land is understanding what you do have access to and learning about it both through research and then also just like physical interaction and so in some ways I think it is cultural because it's going to be very specific to where you are um but I don't necessarily I don't know <laughs> I think we see evidence of both of like because the mandrake and the mandragora example and also parts where like maybe they're called the same thing, but they they are still considered to be very different plants. Fel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this is actually very interesting. So this comes up quite a bit or at least a little bit in traditional practices like Hellenism. So I'm specifically thinking of hyacinth, right? So I worship Apollo and also Hyakinthos. And one of the dilemmas that I had to wrestle with was hyacinth. So in the myth of Hyakinthos, obviously Hyakinthos, hyacinth. That's literally what his name is. <laughs> However, people now think that what they referred to as hyacinth is now what we call larkspur. And larkspur and hyacinth are completely completely different plants. Hyacinth is more related to asparagus than it is to larkspur, and larkspur is related to ranunculuses and not ranunculi, and and not at all to Like, they're not at all, they don't even really look that similar, in my opinion. Well, they kind of look similar-ish, but they're, like, not at all genetically related. So oftentimes people will kind of get up in arms, and they're like, well, actually, it's referring to larkspur, not hyacinth. First of all, when it's, it's hard when you're looking at ancient texts because it's it's hard to know for sure. Like this also comes up with lapis and sapphire a lot, right? Because a lot of people are like, well, what they were calling sapphire was actually lapis, lapis lazuli. And the problem with that, though, is that is always a theory and it's never you're, you're never going to 100 percent know unless a, a text explicitly comes out and says, you know, that. So. For me, like I grow hyacinths for Apollo. I don't grow larkspur just because I'm working with the the name. And I feel like something with the name gives it power. I don't know. That could just be me talking. And like at the time, they also could have been referring to both. They could have called both 
things hyacinths and there's evidence to suggest that later on when sapphire the actual like gem sapphire starts being introduced that they also refer to that as sapphire as well as lapis and refer to both as sapphire so there's also a chance that they referred to what we now call larkspur as hyacinth but also referred to hyacinths as hyacinths and the answer is like you'll just never know so you just kind of go <laughs> with uh i go with what the name is versus what someone's theory thinks it is just because to me it feels better to just be like hey apollo here's a hyacinth for you for you and hyacinth as opposed to hey apollo here's a larkspur for you and hyacinth <laughs> i don't know that could just be me and like you know if you want to offer a larkspur like do that sure whatever but to me it's the it's the fact that like first of all they never made any botanic distinction back then and so i think sometimes as modern practitioners we can like get really into our heads and be like well what like i caught myself one time being like well what genus or like what species or cultivar of asphodel are they talking about <laughs> and I'm like, well, of course, they're not going to make a distinction. They just didn't do that at the time. It was all asphodel. And so it's kind of up to you to make the decision. So I think that can come, you know, unless you're like literally working and like consuming the plant, I think there's not much of a difference and just kind of go with, you know, what feels right, which isn't always the answer in these situations. But I, but I think in, the, in these specific situations, you know, go with what you want to go with because they're both valid i guess you one can make a strong argument for either case i'll put it that way so i guess we were thinking about um how we can use different preparation techniques to influence how we use a botanical and so this doesn't just have like a a psychological effect in terms of like which plant which type of plant we're using, but it has a physiological effect from a materialist standpoint. So many botanicals contain um, active, active ingredients and the method of preparation we use is going to affect how much of that active ingredient is in our preparation versus other um, ingredients. Um, maybe there's multiple active ingredients and the um, extraction method affects our ratio. So I guess I just want to talk to you guys about what kind of preparation methods that you guys use typically for herbs, um, what are your favorites um, and how they can affect the preparations. It depends on what I'm doing, <laughs> to be totally honest. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit later. I can get into the specifics of this. But like typically if I'm doing an extraction where I truly want to extract everything from the plant that I'm working with, I'll use an alcohol, typically ethanol, because it's the safer out of, out of most of your options. But if I know that, for instance, like the bioactive ingredient that I'm looking for is maybe only water soluble, then I'll just extract with water and I won't worry about anything else. Sometimes when you extract with water if you include so I'll get into this a little bit later too but like in chemistry sometimes when we have both like water soluble and maybe fat soluble compounds that we want to extract we will have both a water soluble layer and then also an oil based layer so as you extract and you do the distillation the fat soluble things will dissolve within the oil layer and the water soluble things will dissolve within the water layer and then you can actually just like separate the two fractions essentially and then purify your particular products and so you are able to separate them in that way so it depends on what I want one, I think is kind of the ultimate thing. And depending on what I'm trying to extract from a plant, that will determine what I decide to use and how I decide to do it. I tend to uh, just go a little bonkers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for example, I just foraged enough magnolia blossoms to make something with them. Generally, when I'm working with forage, I'm working with wild edibles like magnolia blossoms. So when I was making magnolia blossoms, the first thing I did was put some to make a simple syrup because simple syrup is an easy way to experiment with flavor once you've condensed it into a syrup. And then I also used vodka to make a liqueur, if you will, because that's another good way to experiment with drinks and also a good way to make sprays <laughs> and it keeps you know i almost never people when they make like rose water spells i see people just like put roses in water and i'm like that's a one-way ticket to mold <laughs> just put it in if you can put it in you know some sort of alcohol if you're doing a spray that's just a random aside here if you are going to make something like a spray out of something and you're using organic material if you wanted to keep longer just add like a little bit of alcohol into yeah. your whatever you're working with and it'll help it keep longer then it doesn't have to be a lot like just a teaspoon is usually enough not even that sometimes just a couple drops depending on what size of a container you're using yeah don't just like stick organic things in the water because yeah. It's you'll grow mold and then you don't want to be spraying that around your house while we're here also use um distilled water or at least boiled water um, because that will keep a lot longer as well 
Yes, I always boil my water if I'm using water. But yeah, or sometimes I'll, I'll make oils. Now, I haven't really invested in a good scentless oil, like jojoba oil or grapeseed oil, oils that are really good at transferring. So I haven't really gotten into that as much, but that's another thing that I do. Or I'll do, I've started getting to, I think it's called floraging, where you take flower petals and like put them into like usually vegetable shortening or traditionally it would be some kind of animal fat to infuse it that way just because flower petals tend to be a little bit more delicate and can't really withstand the oil so I tend to when I'm first experimenting with herbs is I will do the things like oil infusions alcohol infusions or simple syrups where I can then you know oils can be experimented dressed on candles I'm not going to put simple syrup on them that would be silly so I do things where I can experiment them with if they're edible with taste but also you know vodka infused stuff can be used for sprays or I can use the oil to experiment with addressing something with that property or like I'll dry them if I'm burning them usually but generally my favorite ways are like infusing something because I find it very easy to experiment with whatever that herb is I don't know if it's like my Taurus coming through but I I just love to eat stuff (laughs) I love to munch on things that I found uh, outside Safely, of course. But okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how these preparation methods can affect what effects we get out of this, um, specifically magically. So the first thing to mention is drying botanicals. So none of you mentioned drying things out, but I know it is a really common way of preparing herbs, um, particularly because it um, lets them last longer. You can then use them in a tea or something. But something that I don't really see mentioned too often is that when you dry a botanical out, very often it will make it more potent. So this is because you lose a lot of the water content, but gram for gram, you now have more of your active ingredient if it's maintained. So when you actually prepare something, you need to pay close attention to whether it's a dried botanical or a fresh one, because the potency of that could increase really quite dramatically um, if you are drying it out. Um, Dose really, really matters. Sometimes there might also be like a paradoxical effect, a compound causing a paradoxical effect um, in there. So a higher dose isn't necessarily going to mean a higher effect. But yeah, it's just really worth bearing in mind. You're, you guys mentioned heat as well. So this is really common in generating essential oils, absolutes, um, distillation. Um, the reason we use this is mainly because it speeds up the process of diffusion, but also because with things like roots, so if you make a de- decoction of a root, for example, you really need some heat to like break down those cell walls. Um, do you guys have anything more to say about how to how you use heat? Not really. <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely a very, like, that's a very common way to help an extraction, right? I mean, you use it in coffee and tea. Like, the, the, the fact that your water is hot is important. If you were to pour cold water over, like, a tea blend, it's going to take it almost, like, three times as long to extract. Um, okay. So heat is really important when it comes to extraction. It's probably one of the main components, I would say. Yeah, and pretty much the only reason I could think of for not doing a heat extraction is if the whatever you're extracting is too delicate to Mm -hmm. like I was talking about floraging like Mm -hmm. you flowers or certain specific kinds of flowers you're going to cold press them which is going to take a lot longer Uh, but certain things can't withstand heat Uh, but generally those things too you're not usually consuming yeah but even like Um, I know when you like are making tinctures or oils or something you are almost always supposed to put your preparation in a a well-heated space so a dark and usually heated space Um, because that assists with the extraction process and you'll get a much better outcome like a result at the very end heat is pretty much always a necessity there from what i've seen um but i do know that like i read something a couple of weeks ago actually about cannabis and they they do something called a co2 extraction and they um keep the co2 at the super critical point which is essentially this point where it's it's in liquid form but like right before it turns into a gas and they pass that through the cannabis and they, they extract things that way, which isn't heat related necessarily. Um, but I thought it was really interesting. It was kind of like a cool extraction. But they also found that it doesn't extract nearly as well as something like ethanol does. The random, random fun fact in there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty commonly used for perfumery, actually. Um, for particularly things like rose as well. So that makes tons of sense. Like if something's really delicate, like Fel said, yeah, you might want to use rose CO2 at absolute because it's yeah. a lot. But yeah, heat, really important also because especially if you're foraging stuff, it can also destroy unwanted compounds. Now, this is not going to get rid of everything. I just want to point this out. Like, if you have something poisonous, heating it is not necessarily going to make it safe. So make that abundantly clear. However, there are certain things um, that can be made safe by heating. So I found out that morel mushrooms contain hydrazine, which I thought was 
whack. Because <laughs> uh, hydrazine is used, oh God, it's, it's used for so many chemical purposes. I mean, it's used for even some kind of explosives. I'm not saying that you can use mushrooms to make explosives, but it was quite surprising. You can't because you, it won't be concentrated enough, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, how many mushrooms are you talking? <laughs> um, a lot. But yeah, hogweed as well. So, uh, sorry, I'm clarifying that um, I'm talking about cow parsley hogweed. Um, so that's Heracleum's fundophilium, not giant hogweed. If you want to, it is very, very, very toxic. So I wouldn't recommend this unless you are abundantly experienced. But you can prepare that with heat to use safely. The reason it's not safe to use is that it contains uh, furanocoumarins, which are toxic compounds that are destroyed by cooking. Um, incidentally, these are actually the same compounds that are in grapefruit, which interfere with medication. So I didn't, I didn't realize that. I'm going to happily enjoy some more grapefruit tea now that I haven't been able to <laughs> drink recently. But yeah, it's it's interesting because that's a really useful way to use an invasive plant if you I think, Val, you mentioned it's invasive in the US, right? Yeah, I think all, all branches of hogweed are invasive in the US and it's generally better to err on the side of caution. Pokeweed is another one. I couldn't find any correspondences for that one, but I know it's traditionally eaten in the American South, but it has to be cooked very, very, very abundantly. Uh, fig buttercups, so that's actually invasive here, but people sometimes use it as a kind of replacement for buttercup in terms of the correspondences. So it's really interesting because it contains um, proto anemonin. This can be safely converted to anemonin, which is then broken down by hydrolysis. And you can do that by drying or cooking it, but you have to do either of those if you want to ingest it. Even it can be dangerous to touch. So there are some things that you, you know, before you use them, um, you really, really must heat them up. Are there any other examples you can think of? I couldn't think of a lot of examples, but there are several plants where if you don't cook them, like they will taste so bitter and so disgusting. Like generally dandelion leaves, when you get later into the season, you have to like blanch them and then cook them because boy, howdy, <laughs> are they bitter. I also discovered, and I'll have to do some more experimentation with this. So I might come back to this. I discovered that when I reheated the dandelion leaves in the microwave, all of the bitterness disappeared. And I don't know if that's just because of the way that the microwave, like the literal microwaves work. I'll have to do some trial and error or do my own little uh, test study with myself on dandelion leaves to see if there's something to that. But for example, like acorns must be leached, which can be done through either hot water or cold water. It's basically like runny over with water like a bajillion times must be leached before eating they won't really kill you but they will taste nasty if you don't do that uh, chestnut mushrooms which are also able to be foraged i grow my own with in like substrate uh if you <laughs> if you don't cook them as my housemate and i discovered <laughs> the hard way god we feel like we were like wow we failed herbalism 101 eating a raw mushroom <laughs> i was like we're so stupid i mean we're, it was far to be fair um if they're prepared in a certain way you can't eat them raw however we didn't prepare them a certain way and we were like very sick for like an hour <laughs> i can't believe uh, that because i eat those like once a week cooked yeah. but i'm yeah. glad that you told me because then there, there may have been one day <laughs> upon which i tried yeah. them raw and i could have got really ill <laughs> yeah i don't know if it was just that we didn't wash them the right way i don't know but a lot of times too with certain kinds of mushrooms if they're cooked they're they're safe you and your mushroom adventures. So yeah, the final thing I want to get onto is solvents. So Astra already kind of touched on this um, with how we can extract things via maybe alcohol extraction or oil extraction. There are also things that you can use um, like vinegar, for example, in something we call an oxymel. So that's like a vinegar and honey extraction. It can be very, very tasty. Um, so do you want to maybe explain why it is that we're going to have different effects from these um, different kinds of extraction? So the, the important thing to remember, first of all, like we can start with the most common, which, which is an alcohol extraction. And because alcohol is so effective at the extraction, again, because it can dissolve both um, or interact with both like oil soluble and water soluble components. And just in general, it's very good at the extraction process. You typically get a very concentrated um, solution from that. And normally if someone's making like an alcoholic um you're doing like an alcohol extraction when you go to then use it in something else you really don't need that much because of how concentrated it is and this is also one of those things where the like the less you use the better typically whereas something like a vinegar or um, an oil extraction those are more for flavor i would say than they are really anything else um you can certainly get medicinal properties more from i would say oil extractions and vinegar just because like essential oils um, of the plants like do have some helpful properties, but they're not going to be 
as potent for sure. Like, for example, with, with vinegar extractions, a lot of you are probably very familiar with this. Like anything called like a fire cider is usually a vinegar extraction. A lot of people use vinegar extractions to make salad dressings. Those are all very valid uses of that. Um, but vinegar only has a very small concentration of acetic acid in it. And even though acetic acid itself can dissolve things that are oil soluble, the concentration in vinegar is not high enough to actually do that. So it's really going to be more of a soluble based extraction, much like water. And water extraction works equally as well. The interesting thing about water extraction is depending upon what you're actually extracting, sometimes you can also get the oil from the plant or the herb binder that you're using, and it'll actually just sit on top and you can kind of scoop it out and maybe use it for other things. Um, that is possible. It's happened a couple times. Typically with like, I've seen it happen pretty frequently with like fruits. So like any kind of like citrus peels or even like roses sometimes, you'll get the oil in addition to the to the water. But yeah, so it really depends on what you want and how concentrated you want it to be. And think other things affect that. Like if you were to extract something in ethanol for a really long period of time, like a couple of weeks, that's going to be hella concentrated at the end. Um, and it's probably not something I would like actually ingest just because of how concentrated it would be. Um, but if you were to leave something in vinegar, perhaps like, for a couple of weeks, going to be pretty strong but you'd be safer to ingest that in my opinion because it's not extracting quite as efficiently and it's not extracting everything so those are definitely things you need to keep into consideration when you choose your extraction method and that will also affect the amount of time that you extract for and you know so on and so forth yeah and then when we come back to like correspondences we've got to think of like if so for example if you do a rose extraction and you have rose water versus rose oil one of those is going to have a very different smell a very different feel and so it might be that you use one of those in one spell and one of them in another because they, I mean, UPG wise, they just feel quite different. So it's just something to bear in mind. Like the, the extraction methods are not equal and um, they might lead to some kind of interesting discoveries. Yeah, like if if the smell is something that's really important to you, then the oil is going to be what you're, what you're going to want to use. But if maybe a different property of the rose is, like I know rose water is often used for beauty, right? So maybe you want to incorporate like rose water into your glamour routine, then you wouldn't want to use the oil um, because that can be sensitizing, but you would want to use the water. So it really just depends on what you're, what you're going for um, and to make sure that you choose the right extraction method just to both be safe and also... So you can use it for kind of the appropriate magical purposes as well. Yeah, good point. I think we're all done. Uh, anything else that you guys want to add? Or... I don't have anything else. <laughs> okay, well, I think if nobody has anything else, we will conclude this episode. Um, I hope you learned a lot. We kind of talked about a lot of different things all thrown together. Um, but that's what makes these episodes really fun. So that's the last um, installment of this little mini series. And we'll be back next week. So join us then. Yeah, have a good day, everyone. 